So today, the theme I address is what am I bringing to the table? What am I bringing to the table? Now, there is, there is a wide difference um, between how marriage is conceived in the church and how it is conceived in the world. And for those of us in this part of the world, I mean, Western societies have redefined gender roles, even in marriage. And when you look at the way marriage is understood, it's so different from how we are taught according to the scriptures. I watched a video eh, <laughs> of a wedding by two Black Americans or African Americans um, some time ago, and it was very funny. When they were um, sharing the vows, you know, the man first. So the man said, to, I will love you, I will taste that very beautifully. I will love you, I just as Christ loved the church, I will love you like my body, blah, 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 very nice. When they got to the time of the lady, and then the line which says, I will submit to you just as to Christ. The lady said, no, 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 she can't do that. She can't submit to the man, the high court. She doesn't see why she should submit to the man. And the minister was trying to explain that. That is, I mean, Christian marriage, that is how it goes. No, 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 she doesn't agree. So she did not speak that line of submission. But the man was expected to love her and to care for her and all that. So when you look at the principle of marriage from the biblical perspective, and then the, um, I mean, circular angle, there are two different things, honestly, two different things. And so when you have couples who are not instructed in the word, they end up creating hell for themselves at home. Because for us, there is a normative position. There's a normative position. Scripture teaches us exactly how we should organize marriage. And so I'm going to speak from the scriptural normative position on this matter. And part of what I might say may contradict the popular doctrines of gender equality, but that is scripture. You see, the concept of gender equality is true, but it's not so in marriage. According to the New Testament, according to the New Testament, it's not, it's, in marriage, there is no gender equality in marriage at all. And as believers, we need to embrace ourselves with the biblical position because it gives peace in the end. It gives order in the end. It gives joy and excitement in the home in the end. And I therefore want us to read the New Testament position of the man and the woman in marriage. I want us to read Ephesians chapter five from verse 22 to 24. I'm laying the foundation so that when I start the conversation, we can get the context I'm coming from. Ephesians 5, 22, 24. And after we would read first Peter chapter three from verse five to six. Let's hear what scripture teaches us there. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 1 Peter 3, 5 and 6. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with, it, with any terror. Amen. Amen. So according to the New Testament, the man is the administrative head of the whole. Actually, the Bible says women should call their husbands lords. Now, when I was growing up eh, in my home, my mom used to call my dad mirror. I didn't understand mirror. I mean, as a kid, I didn't understand mirror, 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 mirror. And up until my mom passed away, she always called my dad mirror. I didn't know that this was what she meant. But today I understand that. Oh, okay. So she was fulfilling scripture. I'm not saying... When you marry, call your husband, my Lord. That's not what I'm saying. It's the, the concept we need to get. God has made the man the administrative head of the home. So now I'm beginning the conversation. As a woman, if you are a woman listening to me, you have a choice. You have a choice. And this is a choice. If you cannot submit to a man, 
please do not accept his marriage proposal. Should I repeat myself? You can unmute too. Ah, Dr. Reggie says, simple. Yes, you have a choice because the Bible says, if you marry a man, you, you have to ensure that the man, I mean, you see the man as your Lord. Lord means master. So the man is your master. And the Bible says you have to submit to him just as you submit to Christ. So when you see married women who don't respect their husbands, who argue, exchange words with their husbands, who go to church on Sunday, and they are all over the floor worshiping the Lord. In heaven, God gets confused. What is he trying to do? Because if you do not submit to your husband, you cannot impress heaven with your supposed worship. That's, it's, a, it's against scripture. So scripturally, you have a choice. And the choice is that if you see the way the guy is behaving and you feel that, ah, this one, I cannot submit to this one in marriage, don't accept his proposal. Because the one whose proposal you accept for the rest of your life, you have to accept that he is your Lord, he's your master, and he's the one you're going to submit to. So bounce him if you know that as for this one, looking at the way he's not serious, I cannot submit to his leadership. Heaven will clap for you for making that decision. Hallelujah. And you would have made, or you would have made the right decision because you would have implemented the first condition you must consider before deciding to marry a man. So tonight, I'm going to reveal to you the first condition you must consider as a woman before you decide to marry a person. And for those of us who are already married, this is a reminder. This is, this is a refresher course to us. It's a refresher course to us. So here, let us make the God factor a constant. So the God factor is constant. We are talking about, of course, I don't expect any of us on this platform to go for a man who, who doesn't know God, a man who is not a believer. So that one is a constant. We've settled it. So that is not what I would say is the first thing. We assume that as a constant. Now, let's go to the beginning and see after the God factor, the first thing as a woman, you should be smart enough to look out for in a man you eventually say, I do too. And yes, sir, when you go and put your head inside and later come back complaining and crying for pastors, me, when you come, you are not pickle. I will not pick. All these things we are doing is to prepare you, is to fill you with knowledge, is to equip you so that you'll be able to make the right choice. Hallelujah. So let's go to the beginning and see. The first thing Eve looked at before saying, okay, Adam, you are the one I'm going to spend a half my life with. Genesis chapter 2, from verse 7 to 8, and then, and then we'll continue from verse 15 through to 18. Genesis 2, 7 to 8, from verse 15 through to 18. Genesis 2, 7 to 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, 15 to 18. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep and keep it. And the Lord God com commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Hallelujah. So we see something very profound there that when Adam was created, Adam had a relationship with God. So the God factor is sorted. But the other thing we see is that Adam was given a task. Adam was given a mandate when he was created. And the mandate was for him to tend the garden. It was for him to manage the garden. So Adam had a vision. Adam had a purpose. Adam had something doing. Adam was trying to achieve something. Let's read the verse 15 again. Verse 15. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. 
Adam had work he was doing. He had a vision. So when Eve came, she met a man who was the manager of the largest nature reserve. She met a man who already had a vision, who had a clear purpose. So what connected Eve to Adam was a shared sense of purpose, a shared sense of purpose. So God brought Eve to Adam to help Adam to do the work he had already started doing. When God said, it is not good for man to be alone, he spoke principally in reference to the work he had given Adam to do because Adam was not alone in the garden. He was not alone. But in respect of the work, the vision God had given him, he was alone. So that scripture is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper. It was in reference to the purpose God had given Adam, to the vision God had given Adam. So Eve came in as a helper. The wife was a helper. Now, that implies that Eve was coming to support an already existing vision. He was, she was coming to complement the man. Therefore, the first thing you must, you must understand about a man who is seeking to marry you is his vision. That's the first thing you must understand about a man. His vision, not his physique, how tall and how nice he's looking. Those ones are good. They attract you in the physical. But you're a man more. The house is quiet. Hi, we here. Thank you. Thank you. The physical looks are cool. They are wonderful. But that is not, that should not be. And I mean, all the flowers and the chocolates and the yeah, but come on, they are nice. Yes, I understand they are nice. But the first thing you must understand about a man who is seeking to marry you, because you are going to, I started from the fact that scripturally, the man you marry is your Lord. The man you marry is your master. The man you marry, you are going to submit to him for the rest of your life. And so you should be very interested in what he is doing, his vision for life. So during the courtship stage or the friendship stage, the core question you should be asking is what he is doing with his life. You have to know where he is going because where he is going is where you are going. Where he will end up is most likely where you would end up. So you must take interest in understanding where the man is going. But seeking love first as a priority, and he gives me attention. Look at, look at, look at the reasons why many women accept a man. He gives her attention. Of Fernal, the calls, Mubon Komo deep into the night. Every day he's calling, every day he's showing concern. Sometimes when there is no money, uh, you know, he will send some money. He's buying you this, he's taking you here and taking you there. And after, I mean, naturally, when you concentrate such amount of care and concern on a woman, in, in maximum two months, you would get the woman to, to, to be with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, the woman's heart will melt for you. And so for many women, their hearts melt, their hearts get attracted to the man because of how handsome the man looks, because of how caring supposedly the man is. These are all very important. I'm not saying unimportant. They are very important. But the most important, scripturally, the most important factor you should consider before you say, yes, I've accepted your proposal for us to work together, is where he is going, his vision for life, his vision for life, the direction of his life. Because like I said, where he will end up is most likely where you end up, unless you quit along the way, which the Bible doesn't support. So putting love as the first priority um, or expectation of a man is against divine order. The first is the vision, the vision, the direction, where the man is going. Ah, the man questions. I'm not supposed to give examples, but I permitted to give this example. Mabella asked me a tough question. Eh? I remember so much in 2011 when we were friends. She, uh, she asked me what I do. I told her where I work. And then I told her about Funnet. And then she quizzed me for like 45 minutes on Funnet, what we do. So am I going to establish a church with my people? 
you know, she wanted to know where I was going before um, she would say I do. Because as a committed Methodist, she was not prepared to leave her church for uh, this young guy who is so, you know. So that conversation for me was very, very important. And then I clarified for her, oh, it's a non-denominational group, this is what we do. Eventually, she got to meet Pastor Fee and then ask Pastor Fee questions. And then we're going on like that. Your vision, the vision, where you are going is very important. So you have a choice as a woman. If you're not seeing the vision clear at the courtship stage, the relationship stage, you should begin to ask yourself questions. But if you put yourself, if you close your eyes to all these indicators, and then you put yourself into it, and then later you come back regretting, um, then it's a problem. Hallelujah. Abner doesn't agree with me. Abner, let me hear you out. Pastor, someone will say, is it a vision we are going to eat? Pastor, you well, see. Well, I, I, it, obviously the sustenance is in the vision. The sustenance is in the vision. If you get to understand the man's vision and see, it will help you to see the capacity of the man moving forward, where he's going to be in the next five years, for instance. Imagine coming across a man who um, is pursuing his degree or has started a business and you talk to him and he tells you um, so after my first degree I want to continue with my masters after the masters I want to set up a company do this the man is communicating a vision you are seeing the direction but if you happen to talk to another person who is not too convinced and clear about what he wants to do he's still trying to find his I mean what he wants to do with his life those ones are boys they are not men run away from boys Hallelujah. Adam had work to do. And so when Eve came, Eve came in as a helpmate. So we have established that the man must have a vision. And the vision of the man should be the prime interest of the woman. That is wonderful. Now we come to the woman. So if the man has a vision, then you, the woman, what are you bringing to the table? What are you bringing to the table? As we've established, according to the scriptures, the woman is a helpmate. The woman is a helper to the man. So the woman comes to, a, to support an already existing vision. If he decides to marry the man who is carrying the vision. So to begin with, I, I do not think that um, a, a woman, please listen to what I've come to say very well a woman who is bent on achieving her vision for her life, she'd bother to marry. I'm coming again. If a woman is bent on achieving her vision for her life, I don't think that woman should bother to marry because there cannot be two captains steering the boat or the ship, no. Any double-headed entity is a dragon. Any double-headed entity is a dragon. So one must sacrifice her vision for the other. So this is how I see it. There has to be the main vision for the house, which must come from the man, and a supporting vision for the house, which would come from the woman. Of course, sometimes, sometimes it turns out that the woman has better opportunities to fulfill her vision than the man. And we've seen that extensively. There are thousands of homes where it is the vision of the woman which rules the home. And it is so because such a wise woman would have discussed it with the man and they would have weighed the opportunities and seeing that, you know what, your vision um, provides a better future for the home than my vision. And you see the roles um, turning the other way. And you find the man supporting the woman to achieve her vision for the home. And the woman submits, the woman still submits to the man. I mean, when the vice president of, um, the US came to Ghana, I saw that she visited with the husband and the husband was, was with her the whole time. 
And I thought that was lovely. Obviously, in this, at this stage of their lives, is the woman's vision which is ruling the home. But they have an understanding. They have an understanding. So normally, it is the man's vision which rules the home. It's the man's vision which gives direction to the home. But there are times when the opportunities, the vision of the woman offers the home are more. And so they discuss, and the man now begins to play the head and help me to rule. But the woman does not neglect her duties and does not deny the man of the respect she needs to give him as the man of the house. And so in such homes, everything works out pretty well. That is not the normative position. Your usual position is that the man's vision would, would, would be the vision, the main vision of the house. Because the Bible says the man is the head, is the lord of the woman. And in that context, um, the man's vision rules. So now, the help meet, the position of the help meet becomes very critical because the man is the one whose ideas and visions are running the house. So what do you bring on board as a woman? The name helpmate or helper God put on the woman makes the woman a very superb addition, a very superb addition, a very unique addition because she brings a quality the man doesn't have. I don't need a helper if I can do the thing I'm doing. So if I need a helper, it means that my competencies cannot adequately address the challenge I'm dealing with. So the woman comes in as a specialist. The woman comes in as an expert who comes in to fill up my inadequacies in some area. And then together we become complete and we're able to achieve so much. And that implies a few things. Number one, it means that as a woman, if you are looking out for a perfect gentleman to marry, they don't exist. They do not exist. There is no perfect gentleman. All the gentlemen on this platform, we have weaknesses. We have competencies we lack. And so the helper comes in to help us fill up that competency. So if your standards are such that you are still looking through the names to find a complete man, a perfect man to marry, um, that one, we don't exist. I think they exist on Mars. The last time I heard that there are some, there's a possibility of life on Mars. We can send somebody to Mars to go and uh, do some research and see if we can find such a competent man there. Then secondly, if, if, if your condition for choosing a man is that the man should be rich, the man should be great and meet all your needs, it's a problem. Because if men, men when we get to that point, when we have it all, then we don't need you. We don't need you. We'd only date you for our sexual gratuities for a day or two, then we would, we, would, we would move on. A man would admit a woman into her life as a wife when the man recognizes value. So the key question, the key question, Stefan says he's a perfect gentleman. Ruthie will answer this question next week. Ruthie, Papa, prepare to... I'm, I'm a long time. <laughs> I am a long time. And I'm a perfect gentleman. Oh, Ruthie, please. A perfect gentleman, you see that when they eat, because they don't wash their bows. I used to think I was a perfect gentleman until I met somebody. Then I realized I was a problem gentleman who needed to be refined and who needed to be written. <laughs> From that day, I became very humble. Mm. So a very important question as the woman, and now I get into the, the closure of the message. As a woman, a very important question you must ask yourself today, even for those who are married, and much more for those of us who are not married, is as a woman, what am I bringing to the table? Because I'm a helper. So what's unique ability am I bringing to the table? What am I bringing to the table? Why should a man love me and care for me and marry me? Why? Then this is a blessing now as a fanity I'm giving you. I am offering our women on this platform a conceptual framework 
Me now, my conceptual framework I have developed. Me now, my theoretical framework I have developed. Me now, my philosophical framework I have developed to help you to prepare yourself for impact in the life of your partner. Hallelujah. So what do you bring to the table? I'm helping you to answer this question with a framework. You must demonstrate this in the life of your partner so that you become a partner in success, not in sorrow. So what do you bring to the table? Number one, intellectually, intellectually, you must offer something. And this is what I mean. When you speak to your man, to that friend you are considering, to your husband, to your, the person you are dating, when you speak even the relationship level, you have to be able to improve his intellect with fresh perspectives. I'm coming again. You have to be able to demonstrate that you can be a second brain to the man when you speak with a person. And so he would see that you possess skill set he does not have. And then he begins to recognize you as a true helpmate. Let me give a practical example. Now there is a message um, I preach in Fanet and we are all blessed and I've written about it. The title is Prosyokomai. Prosyokomai. Please, how many of you have heard me preach that message before? You can just make noise. Yes, Prosyokomai. I would never forget. The first time I was preparing to preach Prosyokomai, it was in 2015. And I, I discussed the message, like I always do when I'm in Ghana with Mama B. She listened. She was in the seat the sofa, she listened, she was, I was preaching to her. She listened, listened, she was nodding, nodding, nodding. And then after I was done speaking, she sat down and she tore the message apart. She tore the message apart. And I was deflated. My ego was deflated. And then she began to draw my attention to gaps in the message I needed to fail. Listen. By the time we were done having that conversation, the message had changed. Out of the inspiration I got from the fresh perspective she offered me on that message, I developed that popular message called Pusyokoma and wrote about it. And it has been a blessing everywhere it's been preached. The woman improved my intellect. I remember um, the Commonwealth Hall Heaven on Earth, 2020, 10th anniversary. The, the message I preached on the first night, it is time to run. Omabella cut off like 25% of the message. She tore the message apart in some areas. She's, I mean, she criticized me. She said, well, I mean, this one, the scriptures you are using, they don't connect with the idea here. And I have to rework the message. So she's always the first person I preach to when I'm in Ghana and going to preach. I preach to her first to hear her comments before I go out there to preach. So intellectually, you must you must add value to the man. Offer fresh perspectives. You should be able to offer fresh perspectives when you speak to him on a matter. So you become a second brain. Every man needs a second brain. That is what. Hallelujah. Is somebody learning something? Yes. Yes, Pastor. Brilliant. Then socially. Socially. Socially, your networks associations, your family, friends, must bring value to him. We are still answering the question, what do I bring to the table? And I'm saying, first of all, intellectually, you must be able to offer fresh perspectives to him. Don't challenge him. It's not a debate. It's not an argument. You should be able to smartly open up new perspectives and to enrich his understanding and insight on what he wants to do. Secondly, socially, the people you introduce him to, the people in your circle, social circles, okay, they should bring value to him. They should improve him. Now, that's what I mean. There are some social networks, eh? they drain him financially. Then you have to help me. I hear that today, that's how uh, the world has become. 
you propose to a girl, she accepts on Instagram or Facebook or something. After one week, then they start sending you bills of their mother's school fees. Please, you can confirm for me, their mother is not well and all that. Is that a case happening? Some of us, we did that. That's ago, so, so true. It happens a lot. It's, it's, it's not right. If my relationship with you draws me into a social network which drains me financially, Meanwhile, even before I marry you, I'm parting with money to go and support your family. Um, that is a problem. You are not helping the person socially. Your social networks should bless him with capacity, social capital. And, and, and I wanted to say this. You see, you must understand this as a woman. A man has zero financial responsibility towards your family. I'm repeating it. A man even in the capacity as a husband, has zero financial responsibility towards your family. If he decides to give your mother money after paying your bride price, okay, after he has paid your bride price and married you, if he decides to give your mother money, it is out of respect and honor for her as an in-law. And that is wonderful. But that cannot be his responsibility. No, he doesn't have any responsibility towards your family. Your family is your responsibility. So if as a woman, you become upset over a decision by your husband not to support your family members financially, you are creating trouble as a helpmate in that regard. He has no financial obligations towards your family or social networks. They are a responsibility. The same way his family is his responsibility. And then both of you, your family, is now your joint responsibility. So if your presence in his life causes him to dish out hard-earned resources meant for your family, the two of you, to networks, friends, and family networks outside, you are not adding value to him. If your networks make him complain, your social network makes him complain, you are not being a helpmate. And tied to that is a third conceptual pillar, economically, economically. Now, you have to bring value to the table economically as well. For me, eh, this is my understanding. The man bears at least 70% of the financial responsibility in the home. For me, it's non-negotiable. At least 70% of the financial burden of the home should be carried by the man. I don't believe in this 50-50-50 theory of household economics being practiced in the West uh, now. It is an injustice for me. It's an injustice that a woman will work so hard at home and still be expected to take an equal share of the financial burden. I don't think it works like that. I don't believe in that. Except for cases of infirmity or a job loss or something unfortunate has happened to the man, then the woman can step in and provide help. But it's not the core responsibility of the woman to provide 50% of the financial burden of the home. But I don't believe in that mathematics. However, however, when we read Proverbs 31, we get the understanding that the woman must help to spread the financial risk at home. So economically, your presence in the life of a man must spread the financial risk at home, it is dangerous, okay? When only one person puts food on the table, it's so dangerous. When only one person puts food on the table, why? Because there are too many uncertainties in life to think that a breadwinner will have the same capacity forever. It doesn't work like that. People lose their jobs. People fall sick. People's businesses collapse. The cost of living rises. People die suddenly, including the best of Christians. People die suddenly. And the millions of orphans, both in the church and in the world, should give us ample insight into the many unpredictable happenings in life. They happen all the time. Therefore, even if the woman brings 500 Ghana cities to the table at the end of the month, that helps to spread the burden and the financial risk of the home. The Bible says that two are better than one because they have much reward for their labor. So the wisdom I want to communicate in answering the question, what do I bring to the table here is that even if you do not have a job before you marry, 
Make it your number one aim to earn a living after marriage. I'm repeating myself. Even if you don't have a job before you marry, make it your number one aim to earn a living after marriage. I tell you what, there is incredible joy in bringing some money to the table, no matter the amount at the end of the month. My respect for my wife is up here. Why? Because she earns a living, good living. Yeah. Yeah. She buys her own fuel. She cries though when I close my eyes. She buys. Uh, after when she said money is finishing, then I will top her up to buy her fuel and all that. It's nice. Why? Because she works. It tells the man you are industrious. You bring value to the table. You help to spread the risk at home. Hallelujah. So economically, you must bring value as well. Culturally, culturally, the fourth conceptual pillar. You must culturally bring transformation as well. Now, if you work with a man for three months, four months, and his language does not change to become more positive, more optimistic, um, I think that you are not adding value culturally. You should change his language. You should, I mean, your, your cultural influence on him should transform him from whatever he is to a very positive person, to a very optimist person. The way he dresses, if after working with you for a while, the way of a man dresses does not change, the way he smells doesn't change, his eating habit does not change, his drinking habit does not change, his outing habits do not change. The circle of friends do not change for the better after meeting you. Then you are probably not a good fit for each other. Because culturally, you should be able to influence him. So that's a culture, the way a group of people live. So the way he lives, when you enter into his space, you should be able to help him to transform. Yes, their dressing, possibly. Their dressing must change. Me, they are helping me to still, I mean, somebody is helping me to still change my dressing. I'm so struggling, but yeah. And I'm also helping her to change her dressing. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I will come to the men, the women relax. When I come back, I'll come to the men. The men will run away that day from there. Hallelujah. So culturally, you must be an influence on him. You must bring value to the table culturally. Hallelujah. Then the last conceptual pillar, psychologically, what does a woman bring to the table? Or what can the woman bring to the table? Now, psychologically, it works both ways. Every man wants peace of mind. So if you happen to be a nagging wife or a nagging girlfriend, always challenging every decision the man makes because you are equally wise. I was listening to um, Pastor Elvis Alpha Hour um, briefly on, I think it was on Instagram, a short video of his on Instagram last week. And he said something, I love sir. He said, if you are in a relationship with a woman who, who thinks she's as wise as you are, always correcting you, always trying to instruct you on what to do. He said, run away. As a man, run away. Because such a woman is not ready to submit to your leadership. So if you happen to be that type of woman who is always challenging decisions your partner makes, um, psychologically, you won't give him peace. You'll be frustrated. He will end up in the hands of a dump Slave queen, who when he goes there, he's complaining. The slave queen will just listen ah, and afterwards give him what he wants. Like we stated in the beginning, in marriage, we are not equal in terms of household administration, contrary to popular Western feminist ideologies. So if you are going to quarrel with a man over household chores and everything, I think that you should consider not marrying. Because in most functional homes or functioning homes, the man will commit 70 to 80% of his hours to make money for the home. So he will spend a lot of time outside 
working hard to bring money to the table. While the woman takes charge of the home. And these traditional arrangements have protected homes for centuries. But today, Western ultra feminist ideologies are saying gender roles are different in modern societies. It is not surprising, therefore, that, I mean, divorce rates and the number of single women are at record high in Western societies. The rate of divorce and the number of single women we have in Western societies today has never happened in history before. The same people who are fighting for equality, even in marriage. Solomon said so many times in the book of Proverbs that it is better to live at the rooftop of a house than to stay in the same house with a quarrelsome wife. So you must be a partner the man can lean on in his darkest moments. I tell you what, almost all men try to avoid aggressive and domineering women. They are a psychological torture to us. We just cannot. Like when the woman comes shouting and hysterical and aggressive, we want to run away and we will avoid you for the rest of our lives if it's possible. So psychologically, you should bring peace to the table, bring him peace. And this is what I want to say in conclusion for tonight. I'm sorry I've taken so much time, but I think that usually for the first night, it's always like that. If all that a woman looking for a partner today is bringing on board is her beauty, her physical appearance, then she needs to read Solomon again, I think. Yeah. I see many young women today and their pride as women is in their physical looks, in their beauty. And they fail to develop their intellect. They fail to develop their social skills. They fail to develop their economic skills, their money-making capacities. I see them and I shake my head. And the, I mean, the bulk of the hours of the day, they invest in looking nice and looking attractive. They spend hours on their hair and they are important too, but these are not the, the, the cardinal factors. You know why? Because the Bible says that beauty is vain. Proverbs 31, 30, beauty is vain. In the Hebrew, it means beauty is not long lasting. Beauty doesn't last. And so if as a woman, if you are investing the bulk of your time, your energy, your resources, your money on your physical looks, you are not being wise at all. You're not being wise at all because charm is deceitful and beauty does not last long. Research has shown that the physical beauty of women takes a dive, begins to decline after 30, 32 years. It's true. These are facts, and women themselves know this. After 30 years, the breast begins to respond to gravity. The skin begins to um, suffer after 35 years. The wrinkles begin to come small, small. By 40 years, they have come. So if your greatest investment as a woman or your greatest asset you think you are bringing to the table is how beautiful you are looking. The man will praise you in your 20s. The man may praise you up to your mid-30s. But beyond that, the man will start complaining. Even in the 20s and early 30s, the man will start complaining because you are not contributing anything apart from the physical attraction. But it's not enough in this modern day world. You should offer more. Now, I've said this a few times. Golda Meir a former prime minister, female prime minister of Israel, the first actually prime minister of Israel, um, said something very profound when she was quizzed on how she rose to the top in a patriarchal Jewish society. And Golda Meir said that for her, not being beautiful was a true virtue. I'm quoting her. She said, not being beautiful was a true virtue because not being beautiful compelled me to develop my inner capacities. And the beautiful girl has a handicap to overcome. It is true. It is true. The beautiful girl has a handicap to overcome. Not many beautiful girls are at the top. 
I, I, I cry sometimes when I watch YouTube and all. All the beautiful girls and the discos. They are all on, on, on social media stripping themselves naked for the applause of men. And what share a man usually, they become women of substance, changing societies. They are not extraordinarily beautiful. They are beautiful, but not extraordinarily beautiful. Why? Because such women devote time, energy, resources to build their capacities along these dimensions we have spoken about, these five dimensions and more. They build their social competencies, they build their intellectual competencies, they build their cultural competencies, they build their economic competencies, they build their psychological contributions into the life of not only a man but society in general, and they end up becoming people of far greater value than the woman who won a Miss World in the life of a man. God calls the woman a helpmate, a helper to the man. And tonight, what I sought to do, addressing our role as women, was to help us to answer this question, what do I bring to the table as a man? I'll give you a conceptual framework. And I really, really hope and pray that this helps you to bring value to the table so that your family would get to enjoy you, not only as a mom to your case, but even more importantly, as a wife to a blessed husband, who will thank God like the husband of the Proverbs 31 woman said, many women have done well, but you surpass them all. This is the future I see and I prophesy over your life in the precious and majestic name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>